Well, everyone, we come to the third and final conference for our parish mission. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. All good things must come to an end. But I'm so uh, looking forward to what I'm speaking on uh, tonight. But before I do that, I just want to cover a little something. I should have I should have mentioned this and talked about this before I said before I began even the first conference. And so, because without this, um, it doesn't make a lot of a full sense. And so, all would have been lost. But thankfully, we're going to save the whole thing. <laughs> As you know, I like the word heart. I say the word heart a lot, and it's important that we understand that word. We often, we often think of the distinction between the head and the heart, right? Going from your head to your heart. And I'm afraid very often the distinction um, in our mind is the difference between the head and the heart is a distinction or a difference between thoughts and affections. The head has thoughts. The heart has affections. That is not the scriptural understanding or the scriptural distinction or the Catholic distinction. The distinction between the head and the heart, scripturally, is a difference in depth. The heart has thoughts. The heart has feelings. The heart has desires. It's not just mush. The difference is the depth of those thoughts, those feelings and desires. The heart is about thoughts, feelings, and desires that are saying something about my relationship with God and have an impact and a reference to God and his will and everything that the faith involves. That, those are thoughts, feelings, and desires in the heart and living out of them. And so having, having that now before us, I should actually give my first two conferences all over again. <laughs> and I would enjoy that, but... Secondly, I hope, I hope and I trust over these last couple of days with these conferences, I hope and I trust that many of you are experiencing a certain permission to desire something new from God. I trust new desires are coming up. New hopes. New possibilities. With something new in your relationship with God. I trust they're coming up. Because I think we have settled way too much for something much less than God intended for us. You understand the basic image of all of Scripture and our uh, dear Mother Church between Jesus and us. The image is a bridegroom and a bride. A bridegroom and a bride. What does baptism do? Baptism does what marriage does to a man and a woman makes the the two one. Baptism makes Jesus my bridegroom and me one. What, What marriage does to a man and a woman, baptism does between Christ and my soul. Now listen, dear people. Do you think it's somehow selfish for a bride to want to experience the love of her groom? Of course not. But how many of us who stand in the posture of a bride who receives love from a groom, how many of us even bring that desire to our groom? I'm afraid we have not, we have failed in for forming the faithful, in not giving permission to this most basic desire. Huh? St. John said this this is the key to holiness. Listen to 
we have come to know and are convinced in the love God has for us. But how many of us even give ourselves permission to say that, to want that? I want to experience and encounter your powerful, heartfelt love for me. And then the other image, of course, is father and son. The beautiful father and child relationship. So I just uh, encourage you, if uh, if new desires are coming up, please um, give yourself permission to bring them to him. And that's not selfish. Now on to um, the talk for tonight. Everyone, I want to speak about what I think may be the most prevalent obstacle preventing us from experiencing everything we've been talking about for this parish mission. What I think may be the most prevalent obstacle for us to actually enter into and receive Uh, what God is giving us and entering into his heart through the exercise of faith and hope. I think it's one of the most common obstacles today. And I think it's perhaps the most unknown, untalked about obstacles. And that obstacle is sloth. You didn't see that coming, did you? I knew I was going to surprise you. When's the last time you heard us talk on sloth? Never. Never. Um, but I just, this, is, this has become something I'm profoundly convicted of over the last four or six months. Dr. Peter Kreeft, Dr. Peter Kreeft, a Catholic doctor, philosophy uh, instructor at Boston College has written dozens of books and they're great. In his book, Back to Virtue, he writes this, nothing so distinguishes modern Western society from all previous societies. Nothing so distinguishes modern Western society from all previous societies as its sloth. That's a bold statement. And I'm not here to try to defend that. But whether that statement's true or not, I want you to know I'm deeply convicted. It is one of the most common ailments of the human heart today. Also, I think it's the most misunderstood uh, of the seven capital sins. I think there's very few of us who actually understand what sloth is. And that's why I'm so excited to talk about it tonight, because I think we're all going to learn something. So not only is it very common, it is very misunderstood how most of us understand sloth or sloth. If you're snobbish, you say sloth, like you say vase instead of vase, but I'm going to say sloth because I'm from North Dakota. To understand sloth simply as laziness is to misunderstand it. It's to understand it enough to get it just about entirely wrong. Western society is not lazy. We're frenetic. We're crazy busy. No one can accuse us of being lazy. I'm not accusing us, nor is Dr. Kreeft accusing us of being lazy. We're slothful. Sloth is a special kind of laziness. St. Thomas Aquinas defines sloth as sorrow, a movement of sorrow in your heart, a movement of sorrow in your heart about spiritual good. Let me put it more, more succinctly, sloth is a sadness that comes into you around the whole, the whole proposition 
that you're supposed to find your joy in God. Sloth is a sorrow that comes into your heart around, I'm supposed to find my joy in God. He is to be my joy. Here's what sloth is. You've played your 40th game of solitaire on the computer or Sudoku or Pinochle or whatever else. And the thought comes, I should go pray. And there's, uh, that's sloth. By the way, uh, is a very technical Hebrew word. (laughs) It's so technical you won't find it in any Hebrew dictionary. What's this uh about? But this is so much more enjoyable than prayer. I remember being a teenager being a part of a conversation, I don't know if it was CCD or class in our Catholic school or just in some other venue, but I remember being a part of conversation. We've all been a part of these sorts of conversations. A priest was involved, and we just got talking about heaven. What's heaven like, et cetera, et cetera. And the priest basically said two things. Heaven is a place where you're perfectly happy. You're uh, totally uh, filled with joy. And so he said, ah, oh, well, so, so what do you do in heaven? He said, well, you're with God. You're enjoying God. I remember thinking, that's it? <laughs> I felt disappointment. No hunting. <laughs> no chewing tobacco. No country music. <laughs> This sadness around, I'm supposed to find my joy in my relationship with God? That's sloth. Here's what sloth says in 101 ways God is boring, prayer is boring, mass is boring, being holy is boring, being virtuous is boring. And so what sloth does is robs your heart's desire to seek God. And instead, to seek exciting things like success, making money, getting stuff done. If you remember yesterday I said, how does one receive God? Remember, one of the main points was, as St. Augustine said, the entire life of a good Christian is the exercise of holy desire. Ha, huh, faith sees my treasure is God. That's what, everything my heart's seeking is in him. And so I, my heart's filled with desire to reach out and have him. Sloth says that's not so and robs desire. And so now here's the definition of sloth. It is relational laziness. Spiritual laziness. I don't want to make the effort to have to bring my heart to God for its joy. I want microwave, fast, cheap food. So I grab a bottle. I turn on TV. I eat a bag of chocolate. I enter into the addiction of entertainment. That sloth. I don't want to make the effort to relate my heart to God. 
I'm going to live alone in my heart as a bachelor because it takes too much work. Sloth is relational, spiritual, interior laziness. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, if sorrow is followed, any sorrow, if any sorrow is followed, it results in two things. One, you avoid the thing that makes you sad. So if, you're, if you have sor- sadness around prayer, it's not enjoyable. You avoid prayer. When I was in high school, you could have got me up at 5 a.m. every morning to go hunting. Because it was enjoyable. How many of us come to Mass because God's enjoyable? He's my joy. And so what sloth does is reduce our relationship to God to, I got to deal with him because I don't want to go to hell. But... I'm not coming after him the way a man comes after a bride or even a big buck. (laughs) I didn't plan that. That was funny. (laughs) We don't desire God in the most basic, the most basic relational desires. I want God Because he is my joy. I want to go to heaven because there's nothing more enjoyable than God. Think about it. How could eating God possibly be boring? Objectively. Now, subjectively, it can be. For many years it was for me. And, and parents, you have to form your kids and you, you can't criticize them if they say, gosh, that's, that, that has to be recognized. And that's okay. Tommy, that's okay. If you think it's, bo- if, if, it, if it was experienced as boring, but you got to know the lacking is what's in, the lacking is something in your heart. Not objectively. Objectively, that is the prize. And so tell God that you think he's boring. Tell God that you think him becoming a man and dying and then lowering himself so he can become my bread and my food. And I, Tell him I think that's boring. Tell him that. And then tell him I know that can't be true. There must be something in me that's preventing me from experiencing this most amazing objective reality. So Johnny, Tommy, tell Jesus that. Because that's reality. But sloth is preventing is, is speaking something else. Everyone, why don't, why don't Catholics go to Mass? It's real simple. Sloth. Sloth. Getting a million dollars every Sunday morning? You could get people excited about that. But eating God is boring. Can't get excited about that. And it's because of a lie in the heart that needs to be rejected. And that lie says, what you're experiencing is all that it is. No, it's not. You're experiencing that much. So, how did I get on to all this? So it results in two things. You avoid whatever causes sorrow. And then second, second, one turns to other things that give him pleasure, that give him an enjoyment. 
So when there's a sa- sorrow, you avoid what causes you sorrow and you turn to other things that are going to give you joy that that thing you're now avoiding was supposed to be giving you. Thus, those who find no joy in spiritual pleasures turn to lesser pleasures. Thus, ironically, and this is what I've felt warm inside all day to be able to say to you, ironically, sloth is most often masked by busyness and gluttony and lust. Because I won't make the effort to bring my heart to God for true joy, I now seek it other ways, which makes me busy and gluttonous, seeking bodily pleasures because I don't know how to enter into the spiritual ones. Isn't sloth, it's fascinating, if you'll let me talk about a sin, it's fascinating. Example, think about this, gentlemen, you married men. Imagine, huh, if your marriage became cold and sad and all you had hoped for and once had has now gone cold and sad and the home is a sad, painful place and this relationship is not a, a, now a source of joy but a source of sorrow. What do you do? You stay at work. You avoid it. You get busier. And you find your enjoyment, your companionship elsewhere. Hang out with the guys. Whatever. But what's behind it is I don't, I cannot find the joy I'm looking for in this relationship. And I don't want to put the effort into it. And so I get busy. You know what a, you know what a slothful society looks like? It looks like a society that wants to get rid of the Sunday rest. And let's just turn Sunday into a day like every other day. Because how much enjoyment can you find being with God? Just resting with God. It's a lot more enjoyable. Taking care of business. Getting stuff done. The secular societies, our approach, <clears throat> our society's approach to Advent and preparation for Christmas, more stuff, busier, faster. That's all sloth. Because I don't want to take the effort to enter into that beautiful, humble mystery of God becoming one of us. And so I fill it with distractions. But it's sloth, interior spiritual laziness. I've been, uh, um, as as uh, us priests are spoiled in many ways, one is, at least in uh, the Diocese of Bismarck, we have permission to have a chapel in our rectory, to have the Blessed Sacrament in our rectory. And so right across my bedroom, in the room right across the hall, is my chapel with Christ in the Blessed Sacrament in the tabernacle. And so it's, it's the first thing I do when I get up. I just go across the hall and make my holy hour sitting there with the presence of Christ. It's tremendous. But you know, you know what happens if I'm having a difficult time entering into prayer and like getting quiet and my mind um, quieting down 
and um, getting still inside and all that. When I'm having a hard time and I'm restless, you know what's the first thing that happens? I, I think that picture's crooked. Uh, yeah, I, I got to straighten that picture. You know that that candle. Why isn't why isn't that straighter? I yeah, I, I, I better reply to that email um, that I didn't yesterday. I immediately am tempted to get busy. And dear people, the reason I believe sloth is so prevalent today, it's always, it was always thus, it's in the heart. But living in the age we do today, of all our gadgets, all this technology, and I'm not a curmudgeon, it simply encourages it. Huh, so before when you stood in line at a grocery store and there were two people in front of you, you said a Hail Mary. You said, Jesus, I love you. Now you pull out your phone and check your text for your little buzz. You don't relate to God. Sloth is pandemic. In the midst of discontentment and loneliness, one eating a box of chocolates is firstly about sloth and only secondly about gluttony. All this stuff with the bad stuff on computers, guys, I believe, listen, And this is a merciful understanding to the male heart. It is first about sloth. Because I won't make the effort to go where I find true love, true joy, true enjoyment, true consolation. But the heart needs joy, the heart needs consolation. But because I'm interiorly lazy... I'm then set up for other stuff. One of the things I love about sloth, one of the things I love about coming to understand sloth, I don't lay, I love sloth, is it helps give a merciful understanding to the human heart, to our sin. We're not as yucky or dirty or as naughty as we seem. It's just we've fallen for a lie that what my heart is looking for, I can't find in God. I've been beating up on the elder son the last two days, so I thought I'd leave him alone and go after his younger prodigal son tonight. Think about this young man, this young prodigal son, who ended up spending, wasting his entire inheritance on a bunch of yucky, naughty living and ending up sleeping with pigs Just what got him there. And here's all that got him there. This good young man wanted joy. He wanted an adventure. He was seeking joy like every young person, like every other. Seeking joy, seeking an adventure, seeking friendship, seeking closeness. And here's what ended, got him into the pigsty. I won't find that in the Father's house. That's sloth. For some, it leads to pigsty. For others, it leads to this drug. For others, it leads to, you know, workaholism. But 
but the only thing wrong with that young man is his desire was profoundly beautiful. The only thing wrong is he had a lie when he thought, if I stay home with my father, my desire for joy will never be fulfilled. Sadness around my spiritual good. It's what's behind every addict's prison. Perhaps a more prudent person wouldn't say this, but I can, I think, carve it in, smith it in right words where it's not too bad for G.K. Chesterton, you perhaps have heard this quote. Huh, the man knocking on the door of a brothel is looking for God. He just has the wrong address. And the reason he has the wrong address is because in his heart is, your heart won't find what you're looking for in God. Sloth is what keeps us from intimate closeness with God. Sloth is what keeps us from giving ourselves to a committed prayer life. Sloth is what does this and reduces our relationship to being as faithful to God as I need to be so I don't go to hell. So good people... How about this? One of the great, huh? Great sinners. What makes a great sinner? I, I suppose many things make great sinner. What makes a great, it is a great thirst, a great hunger, a heart that really, really is looking for something. Saul, who becomes St. Paul, Augustine. No one's more quoted in the catechism than Augustine. St. Mary Magdalene, a prostitute, the first one to meet the risen Jesus. They all had this great thirst for joy. And when they, when they were convinced it's in God, that same thing that made them a great sinner now makes them a great saint. If they can overcome the lie that seeking God, seeking God is a waste of time and not worth the effort. So good people, as we begin Lent tomorrow, I suggest, I suggest focusing whatever spiritual practice that it's about overcoming sloth. Christian asceticism, Christian self-denial is never just about ultimately a no. It's about a yes. I want you, God, and so I'm not going to eat this steak. I want you, God, so I'm not drinking this beer. I want you, God, so I'm skipping this meal. I want you. Christian self-denial is always, I want more, not less. Because my heart has come, has, has come to know and am convinced in the love God has for me. So good people, it's been a a wonderful three days for me and may we all generously try to, to bring our hearts to our beautiful God who wishes to fill them.